Okay, uh, I think we can start. Uh, now let me go over this definition. Here, the definition still contains the word network. And uh, we also have all the functions listed, procurement, manufacturing, and distribution. These are sort of the main functions. But the, and another, there are two different things, well, a number of different things here. One of them is the idea of families of related products. Now think about coach holding. Okay, Coach Holding is doing business in a number of different areas. They are manufacturing, one side is manufacturing automobiles, the other side is manufacturing, let's say, tractors, the other side is manufacturing, uh, well, what are they doing? I don't know. Well, uh, let's say that they are uh, manufacturing some food products, and so on and so forth. So what, it, what this means is that the structure that we draw here are not necessarily related to the whole holding, but it's only related to some portion of that uh, structure. So this means that the supply chain exists only for families of related products. It doesn't exist for companies. Okay? So you have the factory of that specific product, the factory which is related to that product, and the distribution center related to that product. But the question here is that this distribution center may be serving for different products as well. So your supply chain is going to show this distribution center here, but there will be another supply chain which might be using the same distribution center. So you see that the objective of this distribution center is not only to maximize her own efficiency with respect to your products, but there might be some other products where they are responsible as well. So this is a complicating factor, of course, but we have to understand that when we are trying to plan something about the supply chain, this DC or here what we call autonomous or semi-autonomous business entities may not only be interested in that part of the supply chain. They might be interested, they might have different interests in different supply chains. Now, this is one of the difficulties because basically here we think that, well, we can sit down if we have enough tools, we can sit down and plan everything perfectly. Whereas here, this shows that the interests of the entities are not necessarily only concentrated in the supply chain of question. They are going to be interested in different supply chains, which makes this a little bit more complicated, of course. So on the other, uh, that's the reason why we have the network of autonomous or semi-autonomous. Now, what do we mean by semi-autonomous? We're going to see it later on you might have some contractual relationship between the other business entities. For example, the DC that we see here has an agreement with ETI for what? For distributing ETI's uh, A-type products all over its region for the next five years. So now, this DC is no longer autonomous but we, we call it semi-autonomous because they, they have some kind of a relation. Now, of course, you can say that, well, having a semi-autonomous relationship may go as far as working together. Of course, that's true. But still, we shouldn't forget that they are different entities. Okay, so this is, this is the reason why I like this definition, because this definition considers Number one, the flow of uh, meaningful products for this supply chain. And unfortunately, one complicating factor is that supply chains actually are going to uh, have some entities, some common entities, which we practically always disregard because it's a very difficult decision to consider. You have to consider, this time, two supply chains to make a very simple 
transportation mode decision, okay, which is not very meaningful. Now, let's, and so the key here is that uh, we have autonomous and semi-autonomous business entities. Now, maybe you heard the word vertical integration. This is one of the buzzwords that is used to describe the structure of manufacturing uh, sector. If you have vertical integration, what do we mean by vertical integration? Vertical integration is as follows. I think a good example would be Mitsubishi at the time. I don't know whether they are still like that. Now, what Mitsubishi is manufacturing, let's say they are manufacturing automobiles. Usually, Mitsubishi is going to own all the, at least one of the key entities in their supply chain at each level. In other words, one of the suppliers of Mitsubishi is owned by Mitsubishi, more the main supplier of Mitsubishi. And if you go all the way, they even have iron and steel, they, they have factories in iron and steel industry. So what they have done is, practically in 1960s, 70s, they have vertically integrated almost everything. They have their own distribution system, they have their own DCs, they have their own retailers. Automobile dealers are usually independent. Okay? So you can integrate everything vertically. So what does this mean? This means that if we go back to this definition again, here we don't have autonomous, but all of them belong to the same business entity. We, we have some extreme cases like that. Now, practically speaking, this is not going to be possible. We know that because you have different parts in a certain automobile which are only manufactured by one or two companies around the world. So in that case, but if you have most of them in your, the same business entity, if it's, it belongs to the same business entity, then this definition fits a lot. In other words, then it means that we don't have the ownership problem. So one decision is going to be good for everybody. Whereas this vertical integration practically does not necessarily mean that this, this single entity owns the other companies, but they have long-term agreements. So we come to the notion of semi-autonomous. Hopefully in contracting in week 9 or 10, we're going to see some examples of this. How can we create a semi-autonomous structure in uh, between two entities which are independent? Okay? So we have to find a way a design, a contract, we call it, so that they are going to feel very comfortable in joining this contract and at the same time work together. So they, it should be profitable for both of them. So we're going to talk about those type of issues. Now, here, and the last thing that I want to talk about is collectively responsible. Being collectively responsible is probably an overestimate. In other words, being collectively responsible does not necessarily mean that you do everything together, but you are affecting each other. And we are going to see that actually in uh, contracts. Now, uh, as time proceeds, we're going to see that this definition is even not very complete. But at least at this point, I think this is sort of a definition which includes this, although we don't have the details outlined as in this one. It's more hidden here. But the more important parts are specifically mentioned. So this is the reason why this is a more meaningful definition. OK, any questions on this? Now. Of course, now, uh, coming back to the issue that I talked last hour, now, everybody knows that manufacturing firms have all these functions. The functions are carried out by autonomous entities, and this has been the way that it was going on for 100 years. So what is new for supply chain then? Supply chain is actually a notion that understands that this is the relationship and tries to find solutions to certain problems using this relationship. Whereas classical production planning or classical understanding of logistics simply assumes that we have this single entity who is solving all the problems. In other words, 
I am going to solve my distribution problem. So what I will do is I will simply find out the quantities that each retailer will need and simply ship everything out. Well, what happens if the retailer doesn't want that? Okay, we have no answer to those type of questions, whereas the supply chain outlook tries to answer the questions from that side. Now, what is the reason of having this supply chain outlook in 1990s? So, let me explain that in very brief terms. Now, you see that, by the way, this introduction is going on very qualitatively, because basically we need to put certain things uh, into some per perspe perspective, and this is the only way to do that. Now, the other lectures are going to be more quantitative uh, in the sense that we will discuss some formulas, some models, and so on and so forth we're going to solve, but you're going to see that I'll spend less time for the solution of those. I will expect that you will be able to solve those problems. I will only describe what the model is, how the solution can be obtained, and so on and so forth. But we will also have not as long discussions as this one, but we will have discussion sessions where we're going to discuss the results of the model. Because I believe that, that this is the part which is going to be crucial for you to understand and take it to the future. OK, now coming to the uh, importance of supply chains. Why do we now understand that supply chain are important? Well, in the past, if you look at the beginning of the 20th century, manufacturers were driving were the drivers. In other words, the best example is always the, the fourth example, the T-car. Now, everybody wanted to have a car, an automobile to drive. And what Ford did was very simple. They manufactured this automobile, same automobile, same color, same properties, everything same, two million a year, and simply sold that. So what's happening here is that the manufacturer is simply driving the whole thing, driving uh, the uh, demand manipulating the customers, sort of. But on the other hand, the customers were so hungry in the sense that they were ready to accept almost anything, because this was something new. So manufacturing in that respect was playing the key role, not only in coming up with this new product, but at the same time with the marketing and selling and, and creating the demand for this new product. Now, whereas when we come to 1990s, nowadays, the customers are demanding. And this is sort of the, one of the main reasons. Now, how did we come to this position? Well, there are a number of different explanations. One of the explanations is basically the breakthroughs in, in, in science and commerce, in a way because now manufacturing is much more easier, and it is not a big deal to manufacture an automobile. Know-how, knowledge is now widespread with respect to manufacturing, and people can come up with new products instantly. Okay, so this is one of the reasons. So we have the technology base there. The second reason is the information base. Now, nowadays, you cannot simply treat people as isolated living creatures. Okay, because we have this incredible information flow. You see something on the TV, and you want that immediately. You want that to be part of you, or you want that to own it yourself. So in that respect, customers everywhere around the world are looking for new things, ways of being different, so on and so forth. So as a result, what's happening is that customers are now demanding. So the Manufacturer is less important now. The demand of the customer is, is, is more important. Of course, there is a certain limit that the customer demand can be satisfied. I mean, you cannot expect that the customer demand is going to be all satisfied, because there might be some customers who are asking for different things, which might not be possible still. But nowadays, uh, the customer demands 
are driving the manufacturing. So given that we have everything coming from the bottom, what we need to have is we need the system of manufacturing, distribution, and everything to be very responsive to this customer demand. Otherwise, the customer is going to buy the need from another supply chain who can satisfy it more quickly and more economically. So in that respect, the issue of customer demanding is not only the issue of uh, not being able to satisfy the demand, but also you have to make sure that you satisfy it on time and, cost, uh, and having with minimum price. Otherwise, the customer is always willing to go to another product. So given this, actually, it turns out that looking at the activities, the, the traditional activities from a different perspective became extremely important. Now, so uh, you might have a factory which is working very effectively. You might have a distribution system which is working very effectively. But if your retailers are not very good, okay, you lose something. So it means that the weakest link in the whole network is determining the level that you can supply. So looking at everything in a supply chain perspective is going to make sure that you have this weakest link as strong as possible so that you can supply the customer demand. So this is the main issue. And so the main issue brought the integration of classical functions like marketing, distribution, purchasing, manufacturing, these are classical functions. And now the need for integrating all of these functions became an important part of the mission. Now, nowadays, supply chains are sort of very interesting in the sense that if this is sort of a supply chain and you have different entities here, and then you have different suppliers here who are also different entities, Depending on the type of product, they may come together as a consortium and make forecasts for the, for the product as a whole. Rather than factory doing the, uh, the forecasting and doing the manufacturing accordingly, they all come together and forecast. Now, what is the reason for that? They want to be able to reach the first-hand information on the possible demand. And they want to make sure that they know that they can affect the demand. And given that they can affect the demand, they want to reflect it to the chain as well. So this is the reason why they come and they forecast together. There are certain procedures to do the forecasting together. We are not going to talk about that, but maybe at the end of the semester, one of the papers might be related to that. OK, so there are very interesting things that can be done if you have this new outlook. OK, any questions on this? Any questions on why we are now more, uh, we are now talking about supply chains. They existed for 100 years, actually. But now we have this new outlook that makes things a little bit different. That's the reason why this definition is much more meaningful than the other one, because we have those issues that are in the center coming in the definition. OK. Now, what are the decisions that we are going to talk about in this course? Well, the decisions are the standard decisions that we talk about in a production planning course. There might be a few more added at the top, but the, the decisions are still going to be the same. Now, the question is, how are we going to form those decision problems will be a little bit different, of course. OK, so what are the decisions? So the decisions that we talk about, we're going to talk about, again, you can have strategic decisions. You can have tactical decisions. And you can have operational decisions. Now, as we have the inventory perspective, most of our decisions will be at the strategic and tactical level. We are less going to be concerned with the operational decisions in this course. In other words, we are not going to talk about scheduling 
or we are not going to talk about certain instant dynamic planning features, but we will be trying to talk about more uh, on tactical issues, actually. Now, with respect to strategic issues, we are only going to see this in the design phase, where we are going to decide on the location of certain activities. In other words, how are we going to manage the distribution? How are we going to manage uh, certain operations and so on and so forth will be our main emphasis. So this is more strategic because you probably cannot change the location more frequently than, than a year. Okay? In other words, the lo once you select the location, you're going to operate with that location for some time. Now, most of our decisions will be tactical type decisions, production, stocking, how, are we, how much are we going to stock in general at, these, at different entities, and this one is going to be uh, sourcing. Well, I may not be talking about sourcing, but this is also an important issue in supply chains. Is it better to have multiple sources that you buy something from, or is it better to have a single source? Under what conditions you are going to have, what kind of a decision? So it's not that simple. We're not going to talk about those, but this is also a tactical level decision. And, And uh, so if I detail stocking decisions, this is basically the reorder levels. So if I am an entity and I'm stocking a certain item, when should I reorder that item? So reorder levels. What should be uh, safety stock levels? And, and so on and so forth. Now at the top of this, these are sort of the standard decisions. We are, uh, at least in some cases, we are going to mention on the effect of transportation. Uh, what should be the mode of transportation? And uh, routing and, and, and so on is going to be if of our concern. And uh, I think mostly it will be this part, but we will have, I think, one or two examples for, for the rest. So these are the classical decisions, but the way that we give those decisions are going to be more important. Okay. Now, uh, In our models, we are going to minimize or maximize an objective function. Okay? But let us understand in general what uh, the structure of our models will be. Now, in general, uh, let me erase this part. So uh, this is going to be basically to open the idea of inventory perspective. So what will be the, uh, let's say, modeling details that we are going to use? Uh, well, we will always keep in mind that we operate over a network. Sometimes this network will be more complicated. Sometimes it will be very simple. But we are always going to operate over a network. So we, are, we always are going to have different entities. So compared to the single location inventory models that we see in standard production planning courses, now we are going to have multiple locations and we will solve the inventory problem of these multiple locations. So we are going to operate over uh, 
over the network. Now, uh, in some cases, you're going to see that this network, uh, well, OK, uh, I think I don't have any, any papers that we are going to see where marketing function is also included in the network. But there are some papers where marketing function is also included in the supply chain network. So you have this marketing efforts going on and affecting the demand, and you decide on optimal stocking levels and optimal marketing effort okay, at the same time. Because basically, those shouldn't be independent anyhow. So, uh, but we are, we are not going to have that. But we will always have a network. The second one is we will see that one of the performance measures will be to reduce the total lead time, especially in the part of the course where we are going to talk about the design issues. We're going to see that the objective will be to reduce the total lead time. Now, what do we mean by total lead time? We talk about manufacturing lead time, transportation lead time, and so on. And <coughs> this is basically a proxy for, <coughs> excuse me, uh, this is very similar to the idea of response time. So if you reduce the lead time, <coughs> then your response time is going to be faster. So this is basically a proxy for customer service. So you're going to have better customer service. Just to simply describe what's going on, let's, let me show the, a very simple supply chain. This is retailer. This is the distribution center. And this is the manufacturer. And then here we have the supplier. So the supplier feeds the manufacturer. Manufacturer feeds the distribution center. And then distribution center feeds the retailer. The retailer satisfies customer demand. So I have this type of an arrow, which means that the relation here is, contains some stochastic natures. OK. Now, if we, this is a very simple supply chain. Now, I know that physically. I need to carry items from one step to the other. So let's say that this takes one unit of time, this takes two units of time, this takes one unit of time. Now, if you don't keep any stock in the system, and when you have a customer coming into the system, what will happen? Well, you are immediately going to give an order. Let's say that we are talking about manufacturing of a very specific machinery, equipment. Okay. If nobody has this item, no stock in the system, it will take four weeks to satisfy this demand. On the other hand, uh, if we're talking about a plane, okay, four weeks or four years is a good time. In other words, planes are manufactured like this. Okay, people are given a certain concept, they are offered a certain prototype, and then companies give their orders, and then the manufacturing starts. Okay? After, of course, there is a knowledge which is accumulated. They have the knowledge of uh, manufacturing the prototype, okay? and they manufacture it as expected. Well, it usually takes longer than expected because they have new problems in the manufacturing line. But basically, you know that it will take four years for you to, give the, to, to get the, the plane. Now, you can wait for the plane for four years. Or let me give another example. Rolls Royce, if you really want to drive a Rolls Royce, then what happens is that you need to give your order much before then your act, you will actually get the automobile. It takes probably a year, year and a half, sometimes two years, depending on what you want, and for you to have the automobile. Nobody keeps the stocks for Rolls Royce. Do we need that? Well, it's very expensive. I mean, it doesn't mean, it doesn't, uh, it's not very meaningful. On the other hand, let's say that you are asking for this uh, uh, Eti Burchak. 
Okay? Now, you go to your bakkal, you want eti burçak. If you cannot find eti burçak, you are not willing to wait for, even for four minutes, actually. Okay? You immediately buy something else. So if we are planning the supply chain for eti burçak, it is definitely going to be different than the supply chain for uh, uh, Boeing planes. Okay, so this is, this is an important factor. And so in, in general, the competitiveness or the customer service is that the response time is actually a customer service. Of course, you cannot have the same response time for all types of products. I mean, we gave the examples. But the, the question here is that if your response time for a uh, uh, for Eti Burchak is probably more than, let's say, half an hour, then you are not going to be very happy. Let's say that you want to buy in bulk, so half an hour is reasonable. So what does it mean? It means that you have to keep stocks everywhere and make sure that that half an hour target is achieved. Whereas, actually, in some other, for some other products, that is going to mean something else. But in general, we would like to reduce this lead time. Okay? Now, of course, reduction of this lead time is not one dimensional issue. Okay? We have to think about the cost as well. But reduction of that is important because basically it's a proxy for customer service. So this is actually one issue. Now, on the other hand, we want to minimize operating costs. Now, minimizing operating costs actually requires the companies to feel that what they are selling is Rolls Royce. Okay? They don't want to do the manufacturing unless they see the customers. Okay? They all think that they are manufacturing Rolls Royce, but they are not actually. I mean, we have only one example in, auto, in the automobile sector, Rolls Royce, and that's the only one. Whereas we have hundreds of different brands in the automotive sector. Okay, so these are the issues that we will be uh, concerning. Minimize operating cost is the standard, but we all we need to keep this in mind as well. Now, of course, what we do is we are going to plan inventory as the buffer. So you see that you can always minimize your costs by placing some inventory in this system. And when you place the inventory in this system, you're going to see that the lead time is going to decrease because there will be some occasions where the retailer is not going to wait for one month or one period because DC will already have that and will, be, will already have shipped that to the retailer on time. So this is not going to be of concern if the DC has stock. Okay? If the DC doesn't have any stock, what will it mean? It means that the total time to get the item will be three or four weeks. Whereas if the DC has stock, you're going to get the item in one week. So keeping it as buffer is meaningful, but we have to make sure that we will be able we make correct computations with respect to this uh, satisfaction. OK, now uh, operating over a network requires that we are going to have multi-echelon models. And so we're going to see some examples of, those, of the classical multi-echelon models. Okay. So this is actually the perspective that we have. And finally, not all the models that we are going to be, see will be uh, optimization type models. We are also going to see some evaluative or descriptive models as well. Okay, so this is going to be something uh, so let me write this as well, because we usually think that models are optimization models, but 
we're going to have these type of models as well. OK, uh, optimization type models. What, what are these models? OK, evaluative descriptive model means that, for example, what you do is you have a certain policy and you want to find out what will be the result of that policy with respect to cost. The, and basically, you don't optimize that, but you impose a certain policy. For example, you say that, what happens if I ship once every month? What happens if I ship, excuse me? No, not trial and error, but it might be like, uh, you see, when you are running a simulation, okay, what you need to do is you need to set some policies and parameters and so on. You don't do optimization in general. So it's like running a simulation, but you do that via an analytical model. Okay, so you simply compute or find out the consequences of a certain action. Okay, now uh, there is a paper by Lee and Billington. So oh, let me keep this here. I need to erase this part. Now, this is one of the initial papers on the uh, definition on the modern understanding of supply chains. It's called the Managing Supply Chain Inventory Pitfall, Pitfalls and Opportunities. And it is the first required reading. Okay. Now, you're going to see that in that paper, it's sort of a very simple and easily readable paper. In that paper, what, you, what they have outlined is uh, the major drawbacks of looking the systems in the classical way versus the supply chain approach. And there are a number of issues which are not very simple, of course. They outline that. And they, and they claim that everybody thinks that if these, these issues are handled, uh, things are going to be much better. So they list a number of things which they call pitfalls and they tabulate that and so on. I think if you read that, you will be able to understand it. It is related to the things that I have discussed here. But what I want to talk about here is more the opportunities that is created by these pitfalls. In other words, what is the opportunity that is created by looking at the system of the supply chain system in, a, in the way that we really want to look. We are going to have some opportunities created by that. And I will talk about these opportunities. And, but you better read about the pitfalls. And I think it is summarized in table one. So once you have the paper available, I may send those actually using the email because uh, the other setting might take some time. So I may send all these three papers immediately. So if you read table one and the related text, you will be able to follow most of the pitfalls. Now, what are the opportunities that are brought by this supply chain notion or managing supply chain inventory? Now, the first opportunity is that you can design for supply chain. So this is a new notion. Some of you might be familiar with different notions, like, for example, design for manufacturability. This was a lot of a, a huge concern in 1970s, 80s, because basically people came up with very good ideas of designs, products, but they were almost impossible to manufacture in a very simple way. And why? Because they had a lot of, for example, circular shapes. Now, if you have a circular shape using standard manufacturing processes, it, it turns out to be very difficult to do the actual manufacturing. So 
by actually twisting with the design, you can still have some kind of a circular shape, but in a little bit different way, twisted way, you basically, people basically redesigned the whole product so that manufacturing was easier. So using the same notion, design for supply chain is one of the things that they see as opportunity, and we are going to talk about a couple of examples related to this later on in the semester. Now, the, another one is the integration of information. So integrate information is another issue. This is nowadays, oops, nowadays this is becoming very crucial and important. And some software packages like SAP, if you are the main company, you might be forcing your suppliers to use certain modules of SAP so that information communication would be simpler. Okay? And before SAP doing this, there were some common uh, information exchange rules which were used, standards, in order to achieve the common information idea. And the integration of information is very important because if we want the independent entities, autonomous entities, to give similar decisions under similar circumstances, we must make sure that they have, they can reach the same information. Okay, this is, this is extremely important and we're going to see some examples. Now, another one is integrate control and planning. Companies nowadays actually come together and companies at different levels of manufacturing, some suppliers, some manufacturers, they come together and they integrate their plans for the future. Why? Because they want to make sure that if the mother company has an intention of increasing its market share, uh, she wants to make sure that the supplier is also equipped with the same strength. Now, if, well, otherwise what will happen? Otherwise there will be some problems from the supplier side. So they plan their future together. So this is another opportunity. And another opportunity is redesign organizational incentives. And I will basically talk about this. This is, this is very important, and we're going to talk about this in Bullweep Effect. Okay? Wrong inf organization incentives is going to create an enormous stock requirement, okay? which is not desirable. You, you want to have everything sort of balanced. And now another opportunity is effectiveness measurement. And it turns out that this is something still not very much resolved. What is a good measure for the supply chain? Can we find a unique way of measuring the effectiveness of a supply chain? This is not very clear because basically we have different entities. Each entity wants to solve it in a little bit different way. But this is something which is still uh, waiting. And uh, so these are the, the main opportunities. Now, hopefully, some of the papers that we are going to see will be examples for these opportunities. For example, we're going to see one paper here in the design phase. We're going to see a couple of papers here. We're going to see a number of papers here. In other words, we will use the pitfalls of the classical system by rearranging everything in terms of the supply chain approach. We will be able to show that we can create some opportunities for everybody. Okay, so this is more or less what I want to talk. Let me see whether I have anything else. Okay, so this is what I want to talk for today. On Thursday, I will start with some review material. Chopra 
uh, chapter chapter 7, 8, 9 and chapter 10 of silver. I'll place these books at the reserve. I think we they might be already at the reserve, but I, I need to check that. And uh, do, do you have any of these books available? I mean, you, you, you might have Chopra and silver. What's a good way of putting these chapters? Maybe taking the photocopy and putting it at the reserve might be meaningful for these. Okay. Okay, so this will be all. Uh, any questions? Any remarks? So, uh, do you think that uh, my voice is making you sleep a little bit? No, it's usually not. But you never know. If you are tired, of course. Sometimes I feel sleepy myself. Okay, so I'll see you then on Thursday at 10.40.